Hello, everyone. Welcome to Polyglot 2022, uh, second day. And now we have a talk uh, by Gabriela Chabo Schuchs, I think yeah. that I pronounce it. And we met three months ago in Poland for the Polyglot gathering. And then uh, she will give a talk about how to learn languages in different stages of life. Please, Gabriela, you may start. OK, thank you, Giuliano, for the introduction. And hello, everybody. Now I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can you let me know if it's visible? You can see that? Yes, everything okay. Okay, <clears throat> okay. so welcome everybody. Uh, my topic for today is how our brain learns throughout the different stages of life. Uh, I hope you will enjoy my presentation, but before I get started, I figured uh, I would tell a couple of words about myself so that you get to know me better. Uh, I am a neural language coach by profession. I am Hungarian and I am based in Hungary. Uh, I am a trained English and German language teacher, but I haven't always been teaching. I worked, I spent some 10 years working for big multinational companies, but then I wanted to get back to teaching, but definitely not the traditional way. Um, I, I really, I was really passionate about coaching and the principles of coaching, and I was looking for opportunities how to integrate coaching uh, into language teaching. And after some research, I encountered neuro language coaching, and I met uh, Rachel Paling, who is the founder of this coaching, um, in, uh, of this coaching. And um, yeah, and training with her was the best decision of my life. And it means we integrate coaching principles into teaching, and we also learn about how to brain learns. And this is how we can make teaching more effective. Uh, as for me, I mainly work with coaches, experts, consultants who need to uplevel their foreign language skills quickly and effectively. I deal with, coach, uh, with English and German, as I have mentioned. But I would like to point out that I am not a scientist, so I am not a neuroscientist, I'm not a psychologist, and I'm not a biologist, but I do have a passion for languages and the science behind learning. Um, yeah, and just as something interesting, I'm a mother of two daughters. Okay, so uh, let's... Uh, Okay, so let's start it. Now, as, as, uh, as you know, the topic is about how the brain learns in different stages throughout the life. And first of all, I, uh, you may question, you may pose the question, why is this topic relevant? Now, first of all, I think it's very important to raise consciousness about how we learn. And if you think about it, the brain is something that's sitting in your, that's part of your body, that it's just something that sits in your head. And of course, it's very useful to learn about it and to, to know more how it works and why it does certain things. And I believe it's really intriguing because it's, it's not something big. I mean, it's, it's something small, but everybody knows it's, uh, it's a supercomputer. And why not know more about how it functions and why not discover some ways about how we can, how we can um, use it better? So I believe every piece of information is relevant. Of course, if you have more information about how the brain learns, we can make the learning journey more effective and efficient because we know how to plan, what to expect, what results to expect. And um, it also means that we can enjoy the learning process more because we know why we learn things the way we do. I am not going to deny it. I would like to challenge the old view about aging. Um, in some cultures, I am sure it's not you people, but I'm sure there are people around the world who look at aging as something negative, like without respect for the elderly. And some people tend to look at aging, uh, yeah, as I've mentioned, as something negative which means they have the idea that old people cannot learn a lot. They tend to be slow, which is outrageous, I believe. And just for you to know, if you believe, if you have negative thoughts about old people, 
research shows that you tend to die younger. So be careful what you think. And of course, if we keep, if we know how to keep the brain fit, you can change the world. Why not? And luckily, we know more and more about how to how we can uh, keep our brain fit, which also means that we are responsible for our brain and for what we can achieve. Um, yeah, as for the structure of my talk, I'm going to talk about childhood first, then we are going to dive into teenage years. We are also going to take a look at what happens between 20 and 40. Then we are going to move on to 40, 50 and 60. And then we are going to take a look at what happens after you turn 60, 70. And last but not least, we are going to look at some practical examples how you can keep your brain fit. If you would like to learn more about this topic, I highly suggest that you read some books by Manfred Spitzer, Gerhard Hüther, they mainly publish in German, but I also enjoy listening to the presentations and reading the books by Barbara Oakley and Dr. Daniel Siga also has some exciting information to share. And I've put here a Hungarian name, Lomb Kato. You might not be familiar with her, but she used to be a very famous Hungarian polyglot. She died about 20 years ago. And what I find amazing about her is that uh, she learned about 70 languages before the internet age. And she was one of the first consecutive, uh, not consecutive, they was one of the first, she was one of the first uh, translators, uh, simultaneous translators. So she's highly respected in Hungary and I personally respect her because she started learning languages after she turned 80 and she achieved all this before the internet age. So before all the technology uh, was available. And she also has some good books. I'm sure her books are translated into Chinese, Japanese. I am not sure about English to be honest because I'm reading her in Hungarian, but yeah, just, just an idea. Okay, so what happens in childhood? Honestly, I love the way that Pestalozzi put it. He said that children learn with head, heart, and hands, which means that they need to touch things. They really need to look close. They need to take a close look at the things that they want to get familiar with. They really know how to examine things. And this is how they collect some experience. And if you have ever seen a child, or if you have ever walked with a child down the road, you will know for sure that even a 10 meter distance won't be a short adventure because they tend to look at leaves, insects, whatever they found, and they take their time when they are walking. And this is something that we can learn from them because now in the internet age, we tend to think that if we want to get information about something, we just Google it. We look at a picture, we read the things, but we forget to collect real life experience. And this is something we can learn from the kids that if you can, you need to touch things, smell things, take a close look at how it works because this is how the knowledge will go deep. Now, I'm sure you won't be surprised when I tell you that they learn languages by immersion. They don't immerse themselves into the language. It's just uh, how it happens. I mean, uh, they are just born somewhere and they get immersed into the language quite naturally. And I am pretty much sure you have never seen a little child or a baby pouring over a grammar book or learning vocabulary they definitely learn no rules. Like they don't have an idea what grammar means. They don't have an idea what vocabulary means. They have no knowledge about the chunks of the language, like about what parts of language exist. What happens is that they hear thousands of sentences before they even start speaking. Another important thing is that they experience, they experiment a lot with languages. They try to learn the words, put them together, and they don't care about mistakes, but they do mistakes. So we have, we, we mustn't forget that they also make, they also make mistakes. So it's not uh, perfect from the first day on they start speaking. And 
of course, we know that kids are successful language learners because at the end of the day, they start speaking the language after at, at a certain age. And now we may ask, is it OK to suppose that we have to learn languages the same way, which means immersion? But it's not the case. Of course, it's very important and it's a good idea. But if we if we don't learn rules, if we don't learn vocabulary, like really in a conscious way, it also means that we don't want to use the adult brain because the adult brain can do things that a child's brain cannot. We are really good at planning things. We can look at rules and then make generalizations. We can think about what we do. We can think why we do this, which kids cannot really do. Like kids are not really good at planning, but we are. Uh, you may, have, you may have heard that most of the neurons in your brain were created before you were born. I don't know about you, but I remember when I was a little girl, I was totally shocked when I heard that all the neurons in my brain were created before I was born. And every day, as I am getting older, even if I was only eight or nine years old, but every single day, I am losing thousands of neurons. And I was terrified. I thought about it that if I learn, if I lose thousands of neurons every day, what is going to happen when I turn 60 or 70? Does it mean I won't be able to think? Does it mean I won't be able to read exciting things? Luckily, it turned out that the fact that all these neurons were created before you were born, or most of them, it doesn't mean that your brain is ready. So it still shaping, you can do many things with it. And luckily, we are not only losing neurons, but in certain parts of the brain, new ones grow as well. Like for example, in the hippocampus, which is on the one hand responsible uh, for storing information before they commit to long-term memory. And the other thing is that as we are born with, I don't know, about 86 mm, billion, billion neurons, like it's a huge number, even if we lose thousands of neurons every day, even after you turn 70, it doesn't really make a dent. So the way how you think and how quick you are doesn't really depend on how many neurons you have. So it's just good to know that even if we lose them, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not a big problem, <laughs> luckily, because we have a lot of them. Yeah, I just put this picture here because I think it's a nice reminder how beautiful the brain from the inside looks like and these neurons and how they fire. And if you think you cannot think really, you just have a sad day, just think about it, what beautiful thing you have in your head. Now let's go into teenage years. What happens here? Uh, of course, it's a time of significant growth and development. And you may think about uh, emotions. And you know this roller coaster of emotions that teenagers experience. If you remember your teenage years, I don't know what you remember, but I'm sure that it has to do with emotions a lot, like being impulsive. Teenagers often behave instinctively. So we tend to think that teenagers are very difficult to handle. And in fact, if somebody has kids, I'm sure most people are kind of afraid of teenage years, what's going to happen when all these emotions kick in. But it's a very exciting thing that's going on in the brain. Um, the process that starts here, it's called pruning. I don't know if you are familiar with this concept, but it basically means that the brain starts imagining, it, imagining itself. Uh, it means that it's getting, um, it's just, getting rid of connections that are not used. If you think about a tree that's growing leaves, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you are a gardener, after a certain period of time, you will need to prune that tree, which means getting rid of leaves that don't help the tree grow. And this is what happens here. The, uh, the brain becomes specialized. It means that all the connections that are not used between those neurons, they are pruned, uh, they are eliminated. And this has to do with the use it or lose it principle, which I am sure most of you have experienced. 
if you don't do something for a long time, if you don't deal with something for a long time, you keep losing that information and it's totally natural. We don't like it. We don't like losing information. We don't like forgetting, but it's for the better because you don't have to store that, that much information. And if the brain is pruned, it means it's becoming more and more efficient. Mm -hmm. And as for those emotions, so let's go back to those emotions for a second. Uh, we discussed that teenagers tend to be really emotional, but it's also because the prefrontal cortex that just sitting right behind your forehead is still developing. And this is the part of the brain that is responsible for decision-making, planning, evaluating consequences and problem solving and it's still developing like the brain is developing for for many many years it takes a long time so what happens in the first two decades is we fill our brain with structures but on the hand on the other hand the pruning process starts as well as for the onset of pruning it doesn't have a specific age like you can't say it happens at the age of 14, 15. It has to do with genetics and many other things, but, but it, it starts and, and it's for the better. This is how you can become specialized. And um, that's why it's very important to know that what you turn your attention to is, um, it, it matters. It matters because those connections between the neurons become really stronger, but this helps us turn towards our interest and find our passion. Uh, now let's move to the next uh, stage, which is between 20 and 40. Now, what do we have at the age of 20? You definitely have about two decades of experience and not only life experience, but also lots of learning. By the time you are 30, most people have graduated. You have collected lots of certificates. Of course, you have life experience as well, but those, all those learning means you have lots of structures. And up to 20, you basically learn what you are taught to learn. Like at school, you are taught to learn physics, chemistry, languages, math, whatever. You don't really have choice. So you just have to learn what they throw at you. But it kind of finishes, it kind of ends in the middle of your 20s, let's generally, but it's not the end of the learning journey. But from this moment on, we learn differently. Our brain gets becomes more stable and most people start a family. They start having a serious relationship around this age. Personality develops a lot. And when we learn, relevance becomes a key word. You really think about what you want to learn, why you want to learn it, what is it that you want to do with that material? And if your brain doesn't find the relevance, it, it's, um, yeah, it thinks, it concludes that this material is not relevant, I won't be able to do anything with it, then it just won't learn it. And we also ask the questions whether the theory corresponds to real life. So what you learn in the book, is it the same that we encounter in real life? So you, ask, you start asking questions. This means this is a different type of learning. Uh, and what is beautiful about this age is that only in your 20s, it, has, it only happens in your 20s that the brain starts functioning as a whole. We call it, we, we say that it's wired, it's integrated, and it means that the different brain regions are connected. And where before there were food paths, now there are streets, which means information can travel much faster. We discussed that in the teenage years, you have this pruning process, like cutting down all the branches, getting rid of all the connections that are not used. And there is another process that starts in the teenage years, and it just becomes stronger when after you turn 20, and it's called myelination. If you haven't heard about it, it has to do with speed, with efficiency. It means that uh, the neurons are kind of covered with a sheath that makes uh, information flow travel faster. If you want to hear numbers and to see how it can be interpreted into numbers, it actually means that the brain, like those connections that are often used, where you focus on, where you pay your attention to, it means that uh, 
uh, that part of the brain or those connections are 3000 times more efficient, like 3000 times. That, that's a huge number. So that allows for speed and really quick thinking in the areas that you are passionate about and that you deal with. Another important process that happens here uh, that the brain regions that are responsible for the executive functions get bigger. You may remember I mentioned that prefrontal cortex developing and now in your 20s, 30s is the time when it's developed, which means you can plan much better, you can focus your attention much better, and you can start juggling multiple tasks more consciously. So you can think much more about what you do and why and what are the consequences. You can analyze much better than before. Okay, and now we have arrived to the next stage between 40 and 60. I don't know what is your idea about being 40. If it's old, young, I think it has to do with how old you are. But it seems, so science suggests that at 40, the brain is, its, is in its best shape. You are good because you are still quick and efficient accord, uh, thanks to pruning and myelination and the brain is still changing. You know, this word plasticity, which means the brain reacts to learning, to information, to what you do with it. It just, and it's still changing. You can stay, uh, change the structures, how it looks, what are the stronger parts by influencing what you do with it, where you focus your attention. You know, it's just like going to a personal trainer. If you train, if you go to a personal trainer, if you start doing sports, your body is reacting to that and your body starts shaping. And this is what you can do with your brain, depending on what you do with it. Uh, you can change the structures and it's still happening after you are 40, which is pretty beautiful, I reckon. What we have by now, it's not only, it's lots of knowledge, lots of, lots of experience and um, no, it's, um, yeah. So it, it means that people can make even big decisions right on the spot without thinking even if there is a lot at stake during these integrated things that all this knowledge experience all the things that you have done with your brain it becomes integrated and you may even remember this story but there was a 57 year old pilot he's still alive called Sully and he did an emergency landing on the Hudson River it happened in 2006 I believe and the huge thing about it it is that all 155 passengers were saved. And of course the pressure was pretty high. Uh, let me show you a picture about it. It's uh, from a newspaper. So what happened, what makes this whole landing on the Hudson River special, besides the fact that all people on board were saved and nobody died, is that uh, Sully got instructions that he should turn back to the airport. So after taking off, he collided with a flock of birds and both engines stopped and he was told to return back, but he reacted instinctively. He realized he won't have enough time to turn back. So he decided to land on the Hudson River and it was really mentioned as a miracle. And after they analyzed the situation, it turned out that he was right. He, he wouldn't have had, he, wouldn't, he couldn't have made to the airport back. It's, it's a really beautiful story. And there is even a film about it starring Tom Hanks. So if you are looking for something nice, I suggest that you watch this film if you haven't watched it before. So Sally was 57 year old when he did it. And it was really outstanding like, the people, people talked about it as a miracle. And he mentioned he did, he reacted instinctively. But if you think about it, behind reacting instinctively, there were 40 years of experience, practice, lots of lexical knowledge. And this is what I meant by saying that people between this age can make decisions on the spot under high pressure when there is a lot at stake. Of course, it's not for everybody. You, I'm sure you know people who wouldn't be able to do that, but it's nice to see that it's, it's possible. So it's, it's possible, it's achievable, and it's really motivating that if you get deep into a subject and if you really 
accumulate all that knowledge and experience, you are able to make decisions instinctively that, um, that otherwise would be almost impossible for somebody younger and with less experience. Now, the executive functions are best in these years. That's why, in general, um, usually people make the best leaders between 40, 60, like on high level management. And getting closer to 60, we have to admit we are becoming slightly slow, slower, which is not, not necessarily a problem because becoming slower also means that you are gathering more information about the subject and you are uh, thinking about what to learn and why to learn it and what you are going to do with it so you you are reflecting more and as by this time you have filled you have filled your brain with lots and lots and lots of structures it also means that you don't need to put new structures into your brain because you can fall back on the old ones and you have time to analyze to look for similarities and that's why it's not really a problem that we are becoming slower. And it has to do with myelination. You know, that thing that has to do with speed and efficiency and that allows you and your brain to be 3000 times more efficient. And this myelination is getting weaker. So this is one of the reasons for becoming slightly slower. Yes, after 60. Now, if you haven't started a rock band yet, but you are planning to start a rock band, rock band, it's still not late, so you can do it after retirement, after 60. If we are talking about lifelong learners, we can say that people fall into two categories. Once people who continue doing what they have all been, what they have been doing all their lives, like they continue working in the same profession, going deeper, even publishing books. And there are people who start something new, something that uh, they have been passionate about, but no, had no chance or no time to try it before. But there is evidence that you can start doing lots of things after you are 60. You can even start earning a musical instrument that you have always wanted to. And there are stories about people who can even give concerts, like they can get to a really high level even after they turn 60. And um, despite the fact that they only started after they turned 50 or after retirement. So definitely, if you want to start doing something new, it's never late. This is the message for me. Yeah, and last but not least, let's let's look at how you can keep your brain fit, because uh, honestly, I mean, who who wants to get really slow and not being able to think fast? So it's um, yeah, so it's good to know what are the things that you can do to keep your brain fit. The first is I'm not going to go one by one. The first is walking, brisk walk. And it's suggested that if you go for a walk, like really brisk walk, I mean, uh, for 40, 50, 60 minutes a day, uh, science shows that it's tangible, like the structures in your brain, your brain is changing. But of course, it doesn't happen um, in one week, let's say, or two weeks. So you have to keep, you have to go for a walk regularly every day for at least 40, 50 minutes. And if you do it uh, let's say for six months, there are already changes. But if you do it for a year at least, then it becomes tangible and then uh, machines can show, brain scan can show that your brain has changed. So don't give up walking. Brisk walk is one of the best things you can do for your brain. The other thing is which I find really exciting is juggling. It also happens and if you aim for Having those balls up in the air for two, three minutes, it's something nice to aim for. And it's one of the activities that's so simple to practice and still it has huge effect on, on the function, on how your brain functions. Music is another thing. So it's suggested that you can try learning a musical instrument even quite late in your life because uh, the changes that it does to your brain are really positive and it has lots of lots of advantages. Another thing is being social. So what all people sometimes tend to do is sit at home, do less things, 
Some other people do the shopping for them. They don't have to go to work. They have less tasks normally, and they tend to spend more time alone, which can be dangerous because if you keep being social, keep going to gatherings, talk to people, learn something. If you are a grandparent, spend time with your grandson, granddaughter, so that they can challenge your brain. So being social, remaining social um, is, is again, something wonderful. And what brings all these things together is dancing because it has to do with movement, music, being social. So dancing has, not, has this type of function as well that it really helps your brain stay fit. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, that was it that I wanted to share with you about the brain so that you have an overview of how the brain learns and functions differently through the different stages of life. Thank you very much, Gabriela. <laughs> Thank you. I think you can stop sharing your screen. Already. Okay, yeah. And let's okay, nice stop sharing. So I, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. so, some uh, people or methods say that uh, we should learn how uh, a child learns languages as mm -hmm. if it was possible uh, because we are now adults. So could, could we learn as a child or what do you think about those methods that make us think that we should learn how a child learns? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good question. And I definitely think there are lots of, lots, lots of, lots of things that we can learn from children, like this curiosity, how curious they are, how they want to learn. Immersion is very important. But if we decide not to learn rules, vocabulary, so not to deal with the language in an, from an adult point of view, it also means that we are going to advance slower. And it also means that we don't use the functions of the brain that we are able to use as adults, but kids are not able to do that. Mm -hmm. Like if you learn a rule, if you look at sentences and you try to find a rule, it means you can find it because you are able to think, you are able to analyze as an adult. And it also means that you are able to build your sentences. But kids cannot do that. They are not good at planning because that part of their brain is still developing. It's, it's missing. They don't have the means to do that. So I, I think we have to combine these two. But only learning as kids, it, it, takes, it, it takes years. It takes yeah. years, basically. If you are like a normal person, not a genius or <laughs> special in this way. Yeah, and I also would like to say that uh, I think you made everyone excited to get older. No. Oh, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Let's see if we have questions. Uh, Magdalena, please. Hey, uh, so great Hi. talk. Thank you. I, yes, I'm definitely much more excited about getting older now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it means longer life, uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wonder how, like, whether you have any tips on how to tap into that potential that older people, I'm, well, so when I'm saying older, I mean 50 plus or let's say even 60 plus. Uh, people who have the potential to learn those languages, but, but they hadn't been learning languages up to the point up to that point mm -hmm. so they obviously were using their brain to um complete different functions not language learning uh but obviously the things that they were doing were also you know advancing them in some way i mean were making their brain um geared towards a specific goal so how can we use that to help them learn now a language which they haven't been doing until that mm -hmm. point. Okay, so you made a very important point there. And when we face difficulties learning new things is when we haven't learned something before. Like if somebody hasn't learned any foreign language before they turn 50, then it's going to be more difficult because it's something totally new for them. But of course, if you have learned like four languages up to that point, you have so many structures to fall back on, so many structures to use that you just have to analyze them and put something, do some modifications. And when somebody hasn't learned languages, then it's going to be more difficult. So as far as I know, this is what, what I have learned, but it's not impossible. You just have to put more uh, effort into that and find the relevance. 
I, I, I believe relevance is the key word. Like if you know why you are doing that, what you want to learn, who you want to talk to, that's going to help you. Yeah, I guess it's easier to reason like that with an adult than with a, ch with a child, like explaining to a five-year-old child why, you know, it will be useful when they're 30 to know mm -hmm. a language. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Have I answered your question? Yes, yes, thank you. So tap into okay. the motivation, basically, is what you're yes. saying. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Let me know if we have questions from the public here. Would you like to ask some questions, people? No one? Come here, please. Rafael has a question. Okay. Hello. Uh, Hello. Uh, I've seen some research about uh, acquiring a native-like accent in a foreign language. Mm -hmm. And usually researchers say that like nine years old is a turning point where you can reach a very good uh, native-like accent. So what do you think about um, about this topic? Like, do you think it's possible to acquire a native-like accent after this age? What does research say about it? Mm -hmm. Okay, good question again. I, I think somebody who likes languages, we all uh, want to know more about acquiring native-like accent. Actual research says that there is a turning point when, when babies are 12 months old. So up to that point, they can, um, yeah, they can pick up any accent because they can hear all the possible sounds of all the languages. Uh, but I'm not an expert of this field, but I, I've heard it's 12 months. That's a really great turning point. Like it's really important turning point. And after that, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think accent is something that you can keep improving. It just depends how much effort you put into that. But I've heard adult people speak beautiful, speak a language beautifully, like native-like accent, but I'm not sure about uh, what research tells about it. But definitely 12 months is a turning point. And after that, yes, you are losing your potential and chances become less and less that you will be able to do that. But I would also love to hear about other people's experience about it who have managed to do that. Yeah, I think we have already had that question in other conferences uh, here in mm -hmm. Boston, and some people told some things about that. But if you say 12 months, then nine years old is already too late. <laughs> or yeah, but I mean, late, because if, if at, at nine it's not late, then at 20, maybe it's not also not late, 30. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's impossible, just, just a question of effort and definitely much more effort than when you are six months old. <laughs> yeah. Any questions from Zoom people or here? Anyways? No? Uh, people don't have more questions, but I have another question. You say that uh, if we don't you use it, you lose it. And if, mm -hmm. if we forget after some years without speaking a language, we forget. And when we uh, resume studying that language after five years, uh, are we remembering what we had forgotten or are those neurons dead and we are creating new, new language with new neurons or are we using the old? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, wow. Now you are, we are getting really deep into this topic. So, and it, um, yeah, uh, when, when you were really young when, and you started learning a language, like you were really a baby and you, you, you learned a language because you lived in that environment and you managed to achieve almost native-like fluency, but really as a child, it means that even after you stop using the language and maybe in 20 years you would forget it or you would think you would forget it, but there is evidence that the structures of the language are imprinted into your brain. But it doesn't have, it only happens when you learned it as a baby. As an adult, I believe it really has to do with the level like if you have managed to reach a high level, it's going to be easier um, to get back to that level. But if the level wasn't high and the connections between the neurons weren't strong, then those connections just fade away. So it has to do with how strong you built those connections. Because you know, uh, neurons, which are often uh, work together, like they fire together, it means the connection between them 
become stronger and stronger. And if the connection is really strong, it becomes easier to build it up again. But if the connection was weak, it means you only dealt with the language just a bit, just some time, just for some weeks, then the connection is, is not strong enough and it, they, it almost fades away. Okay, in that case, uh, when we learn again, it will be new connections, not those. Yeah, I, I, I would say so, but I'm not a scientist like in, so I, I cannot answer that question 100%. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments from someone? online or offline no okay so thank you very much gabriela for this very interesting top topic and talk thank and you for having me really thank you for your attention it's been a pleasure <laughs> bye everyone bye 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 <laughs>